they can hear us. And assuming that the connection.
Great job. Just really quickly, is Loon Lake in the house? Is Loon Lake in the house? They're not here yet? Okay, we're looking for one more question asker. If anyone sees Loon Lake, let me know. Welcome, everyone, to Gonzaga Preparatory School. My name is Steven Schreiner. This is my school, and I am proud to have you here with me today. About 25 years ago, astronaut Anne McLean and I started our freshman year in these hallways. She and I walked onto this campus together and began growing into the people we are today. This school charted a course for us, for me into education and for her into orbit. Our paths have diverged over the past two decades, but today, Gonzaga Prep brings us together again. On behalf of all the current prep students, on behalf of its teachers and staff, and on behalf of its thousands of alumni, like Lieutenant Colonel McLean and me, Welcome to Gonzaga Prep, and welcome to a day that we hope you'll remember for years to come. I thank you. I've been looking forward to this day for months. In all of human history, out of the billions of people who have ever lived on this planet, fewer than 600 of them have been to space. Today, we'll get to talk to one of those people, and not just after she returns from orbit, but while she's still in orbit, 250 miles above the surface of the Earth. Today is something special. Today, we get to talk to someone 
who is traveling at 17,000 miles per hour, literally 10 times faster than a speeding bullet. Today, we get to talk to someone who sees 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets every day. But most importantly, today, we get to talk to someone who can show us how perseverance and grit can lead us literally out of this world. We thank Avista for sponsoring today's event. Without them, we wouldn't be here. We thank Mobius Science Center for applying to NASA and earning approval for today's downlink. We wouldn't be here without them. We thank the leaders at Gonzaga Prep for arranging and hosting today's event. We wouldn't be here without them. We thanked AMPT for arranging the technology required for today's event. We wouldn't be here without them. And we thank Lieutenant Colonel McLean's mother, Charlotte Lamp, not just for her support as we plan today's events, but also for the countless times during Anne's childhood that she encouraged her daughter to strive ever higher to reach her goals. We wouldn't be here without her. Please join me in showing your appreciation. We have a lot of students here today, and not just from schools within Spokane, but from small towns and communities far away from here. Let's see who's in the room. If you're from Reardon Elementary School, give us a cheer. All right. How about Adams Elementary in the Spokane Public Schools? Prairie View Elementary in the Mead School District. Awesome. Loon Lake Elementary, not here yet. <laughs> Guess Elementary in Chewila School District. <laughs> Hutton Elementary in the Spokane Public Schools. <laughs> Spokane Public Montessori. <laughs> Chester Elementary in Central Valley School District. <laughs> Almira Elementary School. <laughs> Small but mighty. Progress Elementary in Central Valley School District. <laughs> Priest River Middle School. All Saints Catholic School. St. Aloysius Catholic School. St. Mary Catholic School. Cataldo Catholic School. St. John Vianney Catholic School. St. Charles Catholic School. Assumption Catholic School, yeah. Trinity Catholic School, yeah. Holy Family Catholic School, yeah. Salish School of Spokane, yeah. the Girl Scouts, yeah. and finally, Gonzaga Preparatory School. Yeah. I'm blown away. I'm surrounded by talent and by optimism. One of you out there in the bleachers is going to do something special. Maybe you'll be an astronaut like Anne. Maybe you'll be a musician, a researcher, a poet, a nurse, an inventor, an entrepreneur. We're here today because we believe in the future and because we know that, like Anne, we have the power to achieve our goals. It took a lot for Anne to reach the International Space Station. She set her course when she was three years old, and she's worked toward that goal ever since. Dedication like that gets noticed. Late last year, as Anne launched aboard a Soyuz spacecraft to the International Space Station, the city of Spokane proclaimed December 3rd as Anne McLean Day. Joining us today, is Councilwoman Lori Kinnear, who represents the citizens of South Spokane in District 2, to read to us the official proclamation. Welcome, Councilwoman Kinnear. Thank you, everybody. What a great turnout. Thank you all for being here. Lori Kinnear, representing District 2. On behalf of the Spokane City Council, we thank you, Anne, for your courage and being a role model for the next generation. 
I read this proclamation on December 2018 during our city council meeting. I'd like to reread it to you now. Whereas NASA astronaut Anne McLean is an alumna of Gonzaga Preparatory School and selected by NASA in 2013 as one of eight members of the 21st NASA astronaut class, and whereas her incredible achievements are inspiring and serve as a role model of what we can be attained when one is dedicated and passionate, and whereas she is launching today for her six-month mission to the International Space Station returning in June 2019. Now, therefore, David A. Condon, mayor of the city of Spokane, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, do hereby proclaim Monday, December 3rd, 2018 as Anne McLean Day in Spokane and encourage our citizens to honor and celebrate Anne McLean's career and accomplishments and wish her good luck on her journey to outer space. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Councilwoman Kinnear. Getting to the International Space Station is a big deal. First off, just to purchase a seat on the Soyuz spacecraft for Anne, NASA paid approximately $75 million. That was in addition to the millions of dollars they spent training her to be an astronaut, teaching her to speak Russian, to perform spacewalks, to repair broken parts, to understand the station's life support systems. Space travel isn't cheap, and NASA wants only the best. And is that the best? But what does it look like to launch to, dock with, and board a scientific laboratory circling 250 miles above the Earth. Let's watch some video. First, we'll launch the launch of the Soyuz MS-11. It lifted off from Kazakhstan, part of the former Soviet Union, during daylight hours and carried three astronauts, Lieutenant Colonel Anne McLean of Spokane, David St. Jacques of Canada, and Oleg Kononenko of the Russian Federation. All three astronauts will be seated in their spacecraft close to the top of the rocket assembly, just, be just below the launch escape system tower. Let's watch. Second cubicle tower separates. Engines have started and are now at the preliminary thrust level, throttling up. And liftoff. We have liftoff of Anne McLean, David St. Jacques, and Oleg Kononenko blasting through the Kazakh sky to the International Space Station. Coffee. Everything looking good so far. Good first stage performance. Soyuz delivering 930,000 pounds of thrust. Coffee. Everything is fine on board. 30 seconds into flight, all parameters are nominal. 30 seconds in, everything's still looking good. First stage will burn for two minutes, first two minutes and six seconds of the flight. Vehicle stabilization is steady. Copy. 930,000 pounds of thrust. Can you believe it? I've watched the, the video a dozen times, and the sound of the rocket engines still give me shivers. About six hours after launch, the Soyuz vehicle had intercepted the International Space Station. Docking in space requires the gentlest of maneuvers. In this video, you'll see not only the crosshair imagery that helps the astronauts line up perfectly with the docking port, but also a view of the Soyuz as it came ever closer to the ISS. Let's watch. 178. You can see the range uh, rate starting to increase as Soyuz begins its final approach. Soyuz currently uh, just under uh, 170 meters away from the space station. Gaining. Great views from some of the high definition external cameras of the station. 12. Есть небольшое такое гуляние. Это 
Station is in free drift. Good contact and capture of the Soyuz MS-11 craft. 11.33 a.m. Central Time as the station was flying 251 statute miles over the Atlantic Ocean. Imagine the thrill of knowing you'd successfully connected with the International Space Station. The very first docking in space occurred only 53 years ago, when an astronaut by the name of Neil Armstrong piloted his Gemini 8 spacecraft to an unmanned Agena cargo vehicle. 53 years later, it's still an exciting moment. Finally, astronauts aboard the Soyuz needed to board the International Space Station their new home for the coming six months. They entered through a small circular hatch. Let's watch. Yep, we see you. And uh, getting a good view, we're getting uh, Alexander Gerst there opening the hatch. You can see Serena Anand Chancellor, NASA astronaut, and in the background now in the foreground, uh, Sergei Prokopiev. This is the crew of Expedition 57. They've been there since June aboard their MS-09 craft that you were seeing. And confirmed hatch opening, 1.37 p.m. Central Time. The International Space Station was 250 miles over the southern coast of Yemen. First out is NASA's uh, Anne McLean. Being united with the Expedition 57 crew, her first space flight. My favorite part of that video is the hug that the other astronaut gives to Anne. You can see as they embrace that something special is happening. Anne has just joined one of the most exclusive groups in human history. She's now part of the fewer than 600 people who have ever traveled to space. We've now seen a tiny glimpse into Anne's journey to the International Space Station. What we haven't seen are the years of training and preparation that went into these moments. Not just the years Anne spent in her astronaut candidate program, but in the years she spent in college and graduate school learning about engineering and astronautics. What else might she have needed to learn? Where could she even start? I bet she was sometimes overwhelmed by all that she needed to master. But I also bet that she sought out people in her life who could give her the guidance and support she needed to become increasingly competent. Like all of us, Anne would have needed to start small in order to achieve something big. Think for a moment about the most basic knowledge that an astronaut would require, an understanding of aerodynamics. How would Anne have learned those lessons? How might you learn those lessons? Whom would you ask for help? What if that person was already standing in front of you? What if all you needed to do was ask? Joining us today is Jake from Mobius Science Center, who will lead us through a lesson in basic aerodynamics. Perhaps this very moment will be the first step that one of you takes towards a new future. Welcome, Jake. I'm excited to see what you can teach us. Thanks, Steve. Uh, my name is Jake. I'm from Mobius, and we are so excited to have you all here. I'm very excited uh, to talk to Anne and be with all of you at this event. So excited. Um, but what I've got for you today is a little bit more. We've heard a lot of numbers about uh, where is the International Space Station, how is it getting around, how fast is it moving. Um, but where is it on our, around our planet has a lot to do with how fast it can move and um, how the International Space Station is designed. So what I have here is a vacuum chamber, all right? And it kind of looks like a cannon because it is. And so what we're gonna do is 
uh, we're going to fire this cannon using just the air around us, all right? So I want you to imagine that if you were, if you were Anne, imagine that instead of being way out in outer space, in, imagine it more like relative to being in a swimming pool, okay? And you're actually at the bottom of the swimming pool, and there's all these water molecules swirling around you, right? There's a lot of water molecules stacked on top of you. It's hard to swim, hard to move around at the bottom of the pool. But if you get out of the pool, you can move around more normally, right? You can move, walk easily. And so what you actually get in that model is a bit more of an understanding of how our atmosphere works. Imagine our atmosphere, instead of water molecules that you're swimming through, we're moving through air molecules. So if you've ever how many of you have ever stuck your hand out of the car window while it's moving? It's very dangerous. You should all not do that. But you feel the air rushing through your hand. You can actually catch some air, right? So if, if you're moving quickly, your hair blows back. If, you're, if the car is moving quickly, you feel wind through the trees. All of that, all of those models of air molecules moving around us. And what you actually are experiencing is more like, in an aerodynamic standpoint, swimming through air molecules like we would swim through water. At those fast speeds, we're really swimming through air. And if we remove those air molecules, we can see what it's like outside of our atmosphere in outer space. And with less air molecules, almost no air molecules to run into, you don't have that force, that resistance, so you can move at those amazing speeds that the International Space Station is traveling at. So what I've got here is this air cannon. It's attached to a vacuum pump. We're gonna remove all the air from inside of this air cannon. And I'm gonna poke a hole in the end of the air cannon. So if there's no hole, if there's no air inside the air cannon, poking a little hole inside of it would mean air would rush in or rush out. What do you think? Who says air's gonna rush in? Who says air's gonna rush out? All right, this is why we do science. All right, we set up a little experiment, we make a hypothesis, and we're gonna find out what happens, all right? So as a proxy for the air molecules, inside the air cannon we have a ping pong ball, all right? Looks like, looks like an air molecule just at thousands and thousands of times the size. All right, so we're gonna watch as this air molecule travels around back and forth. Which direction is it gonna go? Is it gonna rush in? Things gonna rush out? What's gonna happen? So the other thing I brought along with me is ear protection. Unfortunately, I didn't bring enough for everyone. It's not because I don't care about you, but you all have ear protection. Hold up two fingers, stick them in your ears, pull them out so you can hear me. Does it work? All right, so safety is very important. I'm gonna put on some eye protection and some ear protection, and we're gonna get this thing started, all right? It will be loud, so if you have small children, plug their ears, all right? So we're removing all the air from inside the air cannon. And as we wait for it to depressurize, imagine it's like, the, it's like outer space, all right? And all the air molecules around us, like we're sitting at the bottom of an ocean of air, all right? And here we go. You all ready? All right, my friend's gonna cut his microphone. Everybody got their ear protection? Okay. So what happened? So what happened? Did air rush in or did air rush out? Kind of a trick question, right? When I poked a hole in this end, we're sitting at the bottom of the ocean of air, right? And those air molecules rushed in to the air cannon and actually, quite quickly, started pushing on the ping pong ball, accelerating it down the end of the air cannon and it ripped off the other end and uh, not entirely sure where my, where my uh, impact crater went, but it smashed right through that soda can and pretty much destroyed this ping pong ball. So you can see that when there's no air resistance in the way, you can get moving pretty quick, huh? Or do you wanna see it again? Okay, let's see it one more time. So as I'm, as I'm reaffixing the, the tape, we'll get it set up for another 
another shot. Imagine that every level of our atmosphere, as you go up into, as you go up in, into the atmosphere, there's less and less air molecules, all right? So each, each level of the atmosphere has fewer and fewer air molecules. You can move faster and faster. So imagine as that rocket is approaching the International Space Station, those thrusters that are moving at 930,000 pounds of force to escape Earth's gravity, you actually have to work less and less hard once you get up there near the space, near the space station. So you get up to speed and you kind of just cruise. All right. And ab actually, before we had physicists, you can study astrophysics as part of your trajectory to becoming a, an astronaut. Before we had physicists, there's a philosopher who thought, you know, if I could throw a ping pong ball, or if I could throw a ball a few feet and it drops, and I stood up on a ladder and I threw a ball a few feet further and it drops, what if I stood high enough on a mountain that I could throw a ball so hard and so fast that it would eventually match the curvature of the Earth? And if you think about that picture, that's exactly what the International Space Station is doing. It is constantly falling because it's moving fast enough to create what we call an orbit. So as we're watching this one more time, imagine how fast you have to be moving to get that International Space Station in orbit. All right, are you guys ready for one more? All right, here we go. Ear protection. All right. One more. One more can of soda. All right, are you ready? Here we go. <laughs> All right. And if you can see, hopefully I don't get any feedback from this. There we go. If you can see, it made quite the dent, moving at pretty fast speeds. As the ball moves down the tube, it constantly accelerates because the air is pushing it faster and faster and faster. As soon as it reaches the end of that tube, it starts to slow down. If I tried to throw a ping pong ball, it wouldn't make it even to the front row of the audience. But without air molecules in the way, it can get going pretty fast. All right, thanks for coming, you guys. We're really excited to get started on the interview, so I'm gonna step aside and we're gonna get ready. Thanks. Thank you, Jake. Thank you, Jake, for helping us to begin to understand aerodynamics. Perhaps you've ignited for someone in the audience an interest they didn't know they had. That's the power of education. It guides us to see ourselves in new ways. Let me tell you about when I first met Anne. We were both eight years old. She and I were second graders at Cataldo Catholic School. It's hard to remember details from so long ago, but I do remember that Anne was someone who was kind to others. Students joining us from Cataldo today, Anne sat in the same classrooms as you do. She played on the same playground. She walked up the same stairs. Anne and I attended Cataldo together until fifth grade. Here she is. Here she is in her school portrait from that year. It was the 1980s. And we all wore bright colors and geometric patterns. Partway through that year, she switched to All Saints while I remained at Cataldo. Here she is in her sixth grade portrait. Notice the logo on her sweatshirt. How many of you in the audience wear that, that logo too? If you're a student from All Saints, know this. Anne sat in the same classrooms as you do. She played on the same playground. She walked up the same stairs. Anne remained at All Saints through seventh grade. And here's her portrait from that year. 
It was the 1990s by then, but geometric patterns were still in vogue. Anne and I had now been apart for two years, and I didn't know until recently that she'd switch schools again for her eighth grade year. She moved to St. Aloysius. If you're a student joining us from St. Al's today, Anne sat in the same classrooms as you do. She played on the same playground. She walked up the same stairs. Anne and I crossed paths again in high school. We were freshmen together here at Gonzaga Prep. It was 25 years ago, and my memories have faded, so I don't specifically remember having classes with her anymore. But I knew who Anne was. She was the same girl that I'd known when we were eight. She was kind. She worked hard. For four years, we were classmates here on this campus. We sat in the same classrooms. We ate in the same cafeteria. We walked up the same stairs. I found this picture in my senior yearbook. It's perfect, most likely to join the Army. That's exactly what Anne did. From the time she was three years old, Anne knew what she had wanted to be, and she had a plan for getting there. Anne never lost sight of that goal. Anne didn't have the highest grade point average in her high school class. She didn't have the highest test scores, but she had something that counted more than that. She had a belief in herself and a knowledge that she could achieve whatever she wanted. Fewer than 600 humans have ever traveled to space. Anne made sure she would be one of those. The girl I met when I was eight knew the person that she wanted to be. The woman we'll talk to today has become that person. Anne shows what it means to persevere. Many of you here today play sports. So does Anne. For her, it's rugby. But rather than focus on rugby as a goal, Anne learned to use rugby as a pathway to a broader outcome. Let's watch. So the first time I played rugby, I was actually 18. It was the year before I went to West Point, and I was walking across the Gonzaga University campus, and I saw a group of people playing a sport that was unlike anything I'd seen. There was a lot of tackling. I couldn't figure out what was going on. And uh, one of them asked me if I was interested in trying it out, and the very next day I started in my first game of rugby. Uh, I played throughout my time at West Point, and then when I was a Marshall Scholar, I was fortunate to study uh, postgraduate in England, and there I started playing at a higher level. In 2004, I was selected to the U.S. national team. I was fortunate to play a lot of rugby, and then I also coached a little bit right before uh, I went to test pilot school. My last weekend playing rugby was the weekend prior to finding out I became an astronaut. So rugby has surprisingly helped me a lot as an astronaut, and when I'm training in the spacesuit in the EMU, and we're working in our, in our large pool, the neutral buoyancy lab underwater. We're under there for six hours at a time and you really work yourself to physical and mental exhaustion. The only other time that I've hit that point of exhaustion is the 60th minute of a rugby match. When your body gets that physically tired, you can't mentally give up. You actually have to think about things more deliberately with more clarity because you're more prone to mistakes. And it's the people that can overcome that physical and keep going with the clarity of mind that win both rugby matches and that find themselves successful uh, training in the space suit. I am Anne McLean and I am an astronaut. People like Anne are rare, but she's not a superhero. She worked hard, she's kind, but she sat in the same classrooms as me and in the same classrooms as many of you. She waited in the same lunch lines as me and in the same lunch lines as many of you. She faced the same challenges as me and the same challenges as many of you. She dreamed of being an astronaut, just like one of you out there right now is also dreaming of being an astronaut, a musician, a researcher, 
a poet, a nurse, an inventor, an entrepreneur. We are here today because we believe in the future and because we know that, like Anne, we have the power to achieve our goals. Anne achieved, and so can we. Anne is special, but you can be special too. Anne has achieved a lot, but you can achieve a lot too. Just a few minutes from now, we'll have a chance to speak with an astronaut. Orbiting 250 miles above the surface of the Earth, traveling 10 times faster than a speeding bullet. But when you see her, remember that you're seeing the grown-up version of a three-year-old girl who set her sights high. For the next few minutes, as we wait to connect with Mission Control in Houston, let's go on a tour of the International Space Station. Astronaut Sunita Williams will guide our journey. Hello, I'm Sunny Williams. I'm up here on the International Space Station. So this is Node 2. This is a really cool module. Um, of course, most of these modules, you'll see they have four sides, uh, and they're put together. That way we could sort of walk, work on a flat plane, either a wall, a floor, another wall, or the ceiling. But, you know, again, all you have to do is turn yourself and your reference changes. The reason I'm bringing that up is because this is where four out of six of us sleep. And so people always ask about sleeping in space. Do you lie down? Are you in a bed? Um, not really, because it doesn't matter. You don't really have the sensation of lying down. You just sit in your sleeping bag. So here's one sleep station right here. I'm going in right now. You can follow me if you want. So I'm inside. It's sort of like a little phone booth, um, but it's pretty comfy. I've got a sleeping bag right here that we sleep in, so we don't have a, sort of like a little bit of a cover. We don't fly all over the place. Um, but you know, you can sleep in any orientation. I have it sleeping, feeling like I'm standing up right now, but like you saw, I'm on the floor, but it doesn't matter if I turn over and I sleep upside down. I can't have it, I don't have any sensation in my head that tells me that I'm upside down, so it really doesn't matter. The sleep station is also like a little office. We've got a computer in here. As you can see, we've got a couple little toys. I've got some books, I've got some clothes, and other things that make it sort of like home. I'm coming out. And just for reference, that's one sleep station. This one's another right here. There's one on the ceiling, if you want to call it, right here. And then there's a fourth on the other wall over here. So all of us sleep in a little bit of a, a circle. All right, come on back. There's more to show you. I know that there's some questions about how to use the bathroom, and how do you actually live in space like normal? Like at home, I mentioned real quickly about getting up in the morning and brushing your teeth and washing your face. Well, how do you do that? Well, here is the bathroom, essentially. You get up in the morning, and we have a little kit, and it has all the essential things that you need, like your toothbrush and toothpaste and brush. See how, see how much better the brush makes my hair look? <laughs> I'm just joking. It still stands up straight. It doesn't matter where you are. It's always going to stand up straight while you're up in space. A lot of people ask about toothbrush and toothpaste. So luckily enough, toothpaste, you can do it upside right this way, is sticky, and so it sticks to your toothbrush. No problem. Another cool thing is that water sticks to your toothbrush, too, if you can see it. I'll have some water come out. The water is pretty neat up in space. And now, the moment we've all come for, this year's Gonzaga Preparatory School ASB co-presidents will introduce themselves and begin the downlink. 
Hi everyone, my name is Kennedy Siebold and this is Bethany Cummings and as he said, we are the co-ASP presidents of Gonzaga Preparatory School. We are so excited to kick off this downlink and our conversation with Anne McLean and the International Space Station. Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston Station, ready for the event. Mobius Science Center and Gonzaga Preparatory School. This is Mission Control, Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Mobius Science Center and Gonzaga Preparatory School. How do you hear me? I have you loud and clear, and I'm very excited to hear from you. Welcome to Space Station. How does microgravity affect plant growth? Does it change the structure like it does with humans? That's a great question right off the bat because that is something that we are studying right now on Space Station. Right around the corner from me, we have a veggie plant growth facility that is uh, replicating some of the future technologies that we're gonna use to grow plants on Space Station. So plants have the same basic needs up here that they do on Earth, like light, water, and nutrients. And plants also grow toward the light source, just like they do on Earth. And we have found that the roots are not, the root growth direction are not impacted by microgravity or lighting. What's interesting is that seeds grown on the space station are very different. So the structure of chromosomes are altered and they have altered gene expressions. Uh, one example is the cell walls and the walls of the vascular system that transport water and nutrients uh, from the roots to the rest of the plants are a little thinner. And cell structures like uh, mitoco mitochondria are round when grown in space and they have a lower electron density. And so uh, that's a Great question, because that's something that we are studying right now. Uh, and we are learning how to grow plants, uh, both for the health of the astronauts in, in air, uh, you know, plants are good for the air, and also so to supplement our diet with leafy greens when we're doing longer duration missions like to the moon and Mars. What is the biggest struggle or hardest task to do well in space? You know, everything's a little bit different in space. I'll say one of the harder things is just getting used to working up here. You know, when you first get here on your first couple of days, you're running into walls, you're holding on to things, you're trying to figure out how to crawl around in microgravity, you're trying to figure out which way is up. And eventually you kind of get used to the fact that it doesn't really matter which way is up. Uh, your brain kind of remaps in 3D so that, uh, you know, walls can be the floor, the ceiling can be a wall. Uh, and so adjusting to it is a little bit harder. And then I would also say any tasks that, that involve a lot of small little parts. You know, we fix a lot of things on space station. This is our, our very large house. It's the size of a football field and sometimes things break. And sometimes things break in ways that we weren't expecting. And so we have to do maintenance and maybe we have, you know, 10 small screws that are gonna come out and, and they, they would just float away. And so figuring out how to manage all of your tools and all of the screws and washers and everything that you're using to fix something, uh, that can be challenging and sometimes frustrating. Do you, age, do you age the same way in space as on Earth? Uh, 
So, you know, we experience time the same way up here in uh, space that, uh, that you do on Earth. And so we don't age any differently. Now, that said, some of the stress and the radiation and the microgravity environment can cause effects on our body that are similar to aging, things like loss of bone density or immune dysfunction or stiffening of the arteries or muscular, uh, muscular atrophy and even increased cancer risk. So those are similar to aging, uh, but it's not accelerated aging. Uh, they did a twin study. Maybe you've heard about Scott Kelly and Mark, Mark Kelly. They're both astronauts, and Scott Kelly came up to space for a year, and they did a lot of tests to compare he and his brother when they got back, uh, when Scott got back, uh, to see if they saw anything different. And it's a little bit too preliminary to make any definitive conclusions, but there are some interesting things that they're looking into, like altered DNA. Do you see garbage floating in space? Well, so I see garbage floating in space when, uh, when the garbage get, comes out of our garbage can, like this piece of paper, and goes floating around. Now, I don't see too much when we look out of our window, but debris up in, up in orbit where we are, there is a lot of debris outside, and we're traveling very fast. We're traveling 17,500 miles an hour, and that debris is also traveling very quickly. Now, debris can be man-made, like parts of satellites or rockets, and it can also be natural meteoroids. There, in fact, there are over 500,000 pieces of debris that we, are, that we are tracking. We can track it with ground-based radar, optical telescopes, and computer models. 20,000 of those pieces are actually larger than a softball. But when we look out the window, we don't see them. What inspired you to become an astronaut? What education and other kinds of preparation does it take to become an astronaut? You know, I was inspired by exploration and outer space since I was a little girl. Uh, I was three years old when I first told my parents that I wanted to become an astronaut, and that dream never changed. It was something inside of me that I was always passionate about, and I never really could put words to why. I don't know what it was about it, but I can tell you that all along the way, uh, I was continually inspired by exploration. Uh, now, there are many paths to becoming an astronaut. The path that interested me was engineering and being a pilot. So I studied aerospace engineering in, uh, in college and in graduate school, and then I flew helicopters for the Army and became a test pilot. Uh, and so that was what I was really passionate about. Uh, so if any of you want to be astronauts, something that I will tell you is follow your passion, because all of my fellow astronauts, we took very different paths to get where we are, but the one thing in common is that we followed our passion because it's a lot of work to become an astronaut, and it's gonna take a lot of all-nighters, it's gonna take a lot of hard decisions and sacrifices, and in order to stay motivated, you're gonna to have to be doing something that you're passionate about. How do you exercise in space? So exercise in space is really important. It's important not only so uh, for our mood, just to uh, morale of the crew, but also because our body is, is constantly subject to microgravity, which is similar to what happens to your body if you were on bed rest at all times. So we are not walking around, we're not using our calf muscles and our quads every single day as you're walking. So uh, it is very important that we exercise. In fact, we exercise, uh, hello Nick, we exercise every single day uh, for between an hour and two hours. And we have three different exercise machines here on station. We have a stationary bicycle, uh, we have a treadmill that we attach to with uh, rubber bands, basically, like large, uh, uh, large rubber bands that, uh, that hold us down, and we wear a harness. And then we also have what we call the Advanced Resistive Exercise Device, or ARED, uh, and it is kind of uh, like a multi-weightlifting um, machine. So we can do anything from squats to bench press, uh, shoulder presses, and uh, you know anything you can do in the gym, we can do uh, on the weights, and that's really important both for muscle loss and for bone density loss. Uh, we actually call them countermeasures because we are constantly trying to counter the effects of microgravity on our bodies. Does the space station ever hit objects when it is in space? You know, with over 500,000 pieces of tracked uh, debris up here on space and and, you know, in, the, in a similar orbit to where we are, and with many, many more that we don't track, uh, we are hit by debris actually quite frequently. Uh, usually the size is less than about a centimeter. 
and that collision is actually about the speed of sound. And so the, the hole or the dent that it causes on our space station is the size of that debris because it's hit so fast. Uh, now, that said, any larger pieces of debris, the, the tracked ones that I talked to you about, uh, we actually maneuver out of the way of that debris. So we can we have folks on the ground that are constantly tracking us. Uh, the Air Force helps us with that, and folks in Mission Control help us with that. And they will actually boost the space station uh, in order to avoid uh, hitting debris. How do you prepare your body for microgravity? You know, coming to space, uh, there's there's no perfect way to replicate what we're going to do up here, but it's really, really important to be fit as possible before we come up to space. You want a strong heart, strong lungs, strong bones, strong muscles. And so we do a lot of working out in the gym, and that's both cardiovascular and strength. We want to be at the at the the height of our fitness when we come up here because this uh, environment can be very hard on your body. Not only are we in microgravity and not using our bones and muscles, but we're also getting hit by radiation. And so we want our immune systems to be as as strong as possible so that we can uh, so that we can that, that we can survive and thrive in an environment as harsh as this on our bodies. How do spacecrafts get fuel when they're in space for a long period of time? Yeah, that's a great question because we are, I, my mission is 204 days. And so uh, we flew this, our Soyuz vehicle from Kazakhstan up here uh, last December, and we're going to fly home in June. So for that vehicle, when we launch and land in the same vehicle, they planned the fuel to incorporate our entire mission. So we brought enough fuel with us. Now, the space station itself, uh, we have kind of an interesting system. I told you about how we, we can move out of the way of orbital debris. What we actually do is when we have cargo resupply vehicles coming out to the space station, we use they bring extra fuel with them. And when we need to boost the space station, our first choice is to use fuel that those cargo vehicles brought with them. So, for instance, we use the Russian Progress vehicles that are docked to the bottom of space station. We use their thrusters and their fuel. And in mission planning, the planners on Earth plan for enough fuel in order to be able to do that. What do you hope to see and learn about space in your future as an astronaut? You know, that's a great question because the, the International Space Station is a national orbiting laboratory. Laboratory. Every single day we are answering big questions about Earth and about space, about where we came from and about where we're going. But the other thing that we're doing is we're learning more questions to ask. So we have, you know, the known knowns. We know what we know. We know what we don't know. And then there's a whole bunch of things that we don't know what we don't know. And that's the exciting thing to me. One of the exciting things about exploration is that every time we learn something new, sometimes it, it opens up another can of worms. It opens up five, five more questions that we want to answer. So NASA, in the near term, we're going to put boots back on the moon uh, by 2024. And we're you're going to use that as a proving ground for long-term uh, Mars missions. And so maybe some of you sitting in the audience are going to be working alongside of us when we go to Mars. Did you feel any differences as the layers of the atmosphere changed as you traveled to the space station? Yeah, that's a fun question because I love talking about the launch because it was one of the most exciting days in my life for sure. Uh, the space station is about 250 miles off of Earth. And so that's not very far, actually. That's the distance if you guys got in your car and drove to Seattle this afternoon. That's how far away from the surface of the Earth we are. Now, when we got in uh, our Soyuz vehicle in Kazakhstan uh, on, you know, on the surface of the Earth, it only took us about nine minutes to get all the way to space. So the biggest thing that we felt was acceleration. Now, some of you have been in, a, in an airplane when it's taking off or even in a car when uh, somebody pushes the gas pretty quickly and you kind of get that, you know, get pinned back in the back of your seat or maybe like a roller coaster. And that's what it felt like. This vehicle was accelerating like an airplane takes off, but that acceleration went over a whole period of nine minutes in three different stages of, uh, of the rocket. And so we didn't really feel the layers of the atmosphere because the overwhelming sensation in our bodies was actually getting pinned to our seats as our rocket was accelerating. And the third stage, and rockets use staging, so part of the rocket burns, uh, burns all the fuel and then drops off, then a second engine lights up, drops off. 
and we were in our third stage, that's when we were already in orbit and we were accelerating to 17,500 miles an hour to go catch the space station. And that was like a really shaky roller coaster. To access internet on the space station, how do you sleep in space? So two good questions. Uh, taking personal time uh, for, our, for the astronauts' mental health is so important when we're up here for six months at a time. And so we are very lucky to have internet access up here. And so uh, we use it for a couple things. During the day, a lot of our operations projects, our procedures, our, the pictures, our instructions on what we're going to do that day are sent via an internet that we can access from Mission Control so we can communicate with Mission Control that way. Uh, we also can use the internet for personal use on our off time, and that's a great way to keep up with family, you know, check our email, uh, things like that. And so we do have access to the internet. Now, how we sleep in space, uh, we sleep in space just like we do on Earth, except for we would just float away if we didn't tack ourselves down. So we, we sleep in sleeping bags, and they are just uh, hooked to a wall so we don't float away. And each of us have our own crew quarters, which is uh, kind of our own personal space that's about the size of a phone booth. And so we go in there at night and turn off all the lights and uh, crawl in our sleeping bags and, uh, and, and fall asleep. And I can tell you one of the coolest things about getting to space was waking up the first morning and realizing I was floating. That was a little disorienting at first. What does microgravity feel like? You know, microgravity, uh, the first time that I was weightless, something that I realized was it, was it was the first time I felt nothing on my whole body. If I float here, I feel nothing. I don't have any pressure on the bottom of my feet. I'm not standing up. Like all of you in the room, if you're standing up, you have pressure on the bottom of your feet. If you're sitting down, you have pressure on the back of your legs. If you're leaning up against the wall, then you have pressure on your back where you're pushing up against the wall. And all I can say is when you're floating, I feel nothing from head to toe. And that was some, one of the, the most poignant memories I have the first time I floated was, it was the first time in my life that I had no sensation, external sensation on my body from head to foot. What is the most spectacular thing you've seen in space? And have you seen any anomalies from the space station that we cannot see from our perspective on Earth? Yeah, two great questions. Um, one of my favorite things to watch out the window is actually moonsets and moonrises. Uh, you know, the, the moon from here, it's like it jumps off the earth. You can almost see it moving uh, up in the sky. And it's, it's like watching a moonrise or a moonset on fast forward. And it's just so beautiful to watch the, the curvature of the earth and the moon just skipping off and coming up into the sky. It's, that's definitely one of my favorite things. Now, as far as what looks different from here is just the perspective that we have. You know, we saw a very large tropical storm a couple months ago. And the perspective that I really got was, wow, this is a very, very large uh, weather pattern that is affecting a very large portion of the Earth. Now, when we hear about these weather patterns on Earth, it's always attributed to being in a country or in one location. And from here, the perspective that you get is you look down at the earth and you just see the very large hurricane and you realize these affect everybody in the same way. We don't see borders from space. And so one of the perspectives that it's given me is that, hey, earth is small and we're all in this together and we are all affected uh, by the weather patterns and we are, we are all stewards of, of the environment and we really need to take care of our earth. Hi, my name is Addie DeCaro, and I'd like to thank you so much for your time. We enjoyed talking to you, and we wish you happy last weeks on the space station. Thank you. Thank you to everybody in Spokane. It was great to hear from you guys, and I can't wait to be back in the Pacific Northwest here in a few short months. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you to all participants from Mobius Science Center and Gonzaga Preparatory School. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications. Ladies and gentlemen, what a thrill. I have known Anne since we were eight years old, 
and I'm not surprised to see her floating in space. She had dedication, perseverance, and grit, and she achieved her dream. This concludes today's assembly. Here are your dismissal instructions. Please stand by and don't move until we conclude. All guests who arrived by car are welcome to leave first. Buses will be boarded in the reverse order in which they arrived. We'll have classes wait for their buses in the auxiliary gym this direction. Students, please stay together with your class as you make your way into the auxiliary gym. Question askers, please remain seated until your classes walk out. And finally, upon dismissal, Gonzaga Prep students may return to their classrooms. Let's have one more round of applause for all of our event sponsors. Thank you.